Good afternoon and welcome to another edition of Closing Bell. Uh, I'm Surabhi Upadhyay. With me in the studios today is Mangalam Malu. And what we have is a very interesting market. And it's not often that we say this, Mangalam. India being a rank underperformer. Look at Asia, the way markets have reacted to that big bazooka, 50 basis points rate cut. Asia has been all up and about. Europe is trading positive. Even US futures right now, for what it's worth, Nasdaq futures are up almost 2%. You know, Dow, S&P 500, all futures are up. We've seen uh, a bit of a you know pause, breaks being slammed, and some profit taking today. I reckon it was also because of the kind of outperformance that we've seen in the past as well, right? So maybe the street is looking at free money coming in or money coming in at a lower price from the Fed and deploying it to markets other than India, which perhaps may not be as expensive as India is. Be that as it may, it could also be routine profit taking for our markets. You know, uh, it, it, it's a day of two halves. If you look at it uh, from the highs, the Nifty is corrected about 200 odd points. We've had uh, the mid-cap index uh, take the sharpest knock down, down almost 1,500 points from today's trading high as well, which is a record high. The Nifty Bank went within four points of a fresh record high. And from there as well, it saw a bit of a sell-off. So let's see how it pans out. Uh, what are you spotting in stocks? I reckon, you know, 1,900 stocks on the obverse side as against 500, <laughs> which are gaining a lot moving around. Yeah, I mean, the, the bears have chosen quite a day to <laughs> kind of come out and announce their presence because otherwise, I mean, global markets are rejoicing that uh, U.S. money seems to be getting cheaper with this rate cut. Anyway, for what it's worth, I mean, the Nifty, at least it's bounced back above the 25,400 level. That's that's one way of looking at it because the lowest point was actually below that mark. So let's see what the next one hour brings. It's also Thursday, which means you've had the, uh, you know, weekly op options expiry that will play out. So let's see if there's some sharp changes around uh, 3, 3.315. For what it's worth, uh, you know, a couple of stocks on the way up. There's a fair bit of a, of a consumer play, both on FMCG and if you're counting auto as consumer, then, then a bit of that as well. So NTPC, Lever, Maruti, Titan, Bajaj Auto, Tata Consumer, these are names on top. And had it not been for the bank Nifty, I mean, despite all this, the bank Nifty is still retaining a much better looking gain than the Nifty. And had it not been for the banks, then, of course, the picture for the Nifty would have been very, very different. So even now, Kotak, for instance, HDFC Bank, the big boys are still fighting for the bulls. Reliance, ITC, these stocks are still holding out in green. So let's see. I think it might be an interesting last one hour. It'll be a very interesting last one hour. You said what a day that the bears have chosen to announce their presence. I say what a week the bears have chosen to announce their presence, at least in the mid-cap end of things as well. Because, you know, even if you look at uh, uh, the mid-cap index fall from days high, close to around 900 points lower right now, and the broader market's advanced decline ratio, those lines come up for you. It's the third day running where we have over 1,500 stocks on the NSE declining. And uh, give or take everything this week, if you look at it, you know, the Nifty is still up 0.2, 0.3%. So marginally in the green for this week. The mid banks are doing a lot better, of course, led by private sector banks. So the Nifty Bank is up 2%. The mid-cap and the small-cap indices, both of them down 25 to 3% this week itself. And that's at an index level. So a lot of stocks seeing a lot more pressure. I'll be interested to see how the Nifty Bank performs from here on. Is there a risk of a, a bit of a double top on the Nifty Bank? The previous high was 53,357. Today's high was 53,353. So those are a couple of factors that I'll be watching out for. And on the Nifty weekly options expiry itself, you know, this afternoon, the trade was the 25,500 straddle, which is a call and a put put together. Now, with the market having corrected from the highs, it's come down to 25,400. What's the premium on offer of the 25,400 call? 20 rupees. If you look at the 25,400 put as well, that comes up for you. The premium is close to around 10 rupees. So you sell both the 25,400 call and put. The range that you're playing for for expiry will be 25,370 at the lower level and on the way up, 25,430. Do we stick in this narrow band? or do we break down or break out of it will be something that will determine the course of the next hour of trade. Absolutely. So let's uh, watch how this goes. By the way, I mean, just to name one or two stocks before we get to the strategies, uh, some of the you know news-based stocks are seeing very sharp moves today, and you'll hear more about them in the program. Uh, so Vodafone Idea and Indus Towers, absolute slam dunk on these names, thanks to the fact that the Supreme Court is not uh, you know, looking at any sort of a relief now. It's uh, dismissed that curative petition. And those stocks have seen a lot of price damage, uh, you know, in the course of the afternoon. Uh, there's IIFL Finance on which there's, uh, you know, continued regulatory uncertainty. And Bloomberg put out a story saying that maybe some of the rating agencies could be cutting their rating on uh, IIFL Finance. So that stock's under pressure. And more names. I mean, uh, case in point would be Bajaj Housing. Fantastic listing. But now there is some caution and some money coming off the table. 7% uh, down on Bajaj Finance as well. So it's just... Uh, 
you know, a glimpse into the kind of mid-cap correction that we're seeing today. So how should you be positioning yourself for the next one hour, the last one hour? We have Mitesh joining in as always. Mitesh, good afternoon. So yeah, it's not really played as per script for the Bulls, at least not till now. What's uh, your advice for the moment? So, you know, one, I think uh, there were signs of uh, market going into consolidation. But with the Fed event, I think the gap up was much bigger than what I had anticipated. And the Fed was very surprising. But, you know, uh, I think as Mangalam was also highlighting the Bank Nifty, which is the one which has been kind of <laughs> in the index of the last five sessions, was meeting its all-time high. The highest ever closing is about uh, 53,100 and the highest is about 53,350 uh, levels. And today we got a high of 53,353. So, very clearly... It was a, a index which was carrying the weight of Nifty. It was an index which had rallied for five, six days. It was overbought, was meeting the earlier highs. I think there was a good chance of profit booking happening. That is what has happened. It doesn't look like a, uh, you know, a kind of any kind of negative setup, but just I think a mild pullback to the hourly and two hourly averages could take place. And therefore, the consolidation which I thought will, would, uh, which I thought started uh, yesterday, appears to have started today. And uh, I would still believe that till the bank Nifty now breaks into fresh highs. I think you might see the markets go through one or two days of mild choppiness and some pullback. On All the right, stock side, uh, sorry. Go ahead, go ahead. So having said that, on the stock side, uh, the uh, index, you know, which is rallying is, uh, sorry, the, the stock which are rallying is uh, ABFR, and I think, you know, that's uh, now close to its uh, earlier highs. Uh, very good pattern over here. Uh, buy with a stop below levels of uh, 327 and look for a target of 346, 347 to begin with. And on the sell side is ABB, the same way that we have some put options positions with so vested interest, but ABB appears to have broken down the recent lows of uh, 74, 20, 74, 50 zone and now it's trading just around those levels, but I suspect the setup is negative. So sell here, uh, keep a stop above uh, 75, 20 and look for a target of around 7200. I want your thoughts on two stocks in particular. One is Pedilite. Pedilite ended lower in yesterday's trading session because crude prices were higher. Now it's seen that they've been bought. Pedilite currently has moved to the high point of trade. Consumer stocks generally are doing well today. That's one. And the other one is Jubilant Foodworks. It's been in this, you know, it's a sleeper hit from its lows. It's rallied about 60%. And come what may, the stock continues to hold in the green, at least in the face of the choppiness that we're seeing in uh, the markets over the last couple of weeks, at least, we've seen some strength here in both Jubilant Food and Pedilite. Uh, do you have a view? So, Mangalam, Jubilant is something, you know, which I've covered on the long-term uh, chart basis. The stock has recovered and turned uh, very, very positive on the long-term charts. And I suspect uh, I'm looking at a target of around 780 to 800 over here. And eventually, the highest ever monthly closing of 805, you know, so that should be tested. So, the 780, 805 is the target range for Jubilant. My only worry is that this is a six monthly candle, which is on the positive side. So, the stock in the short to medium term is very overbought. So, here I would want to, you know, uh, buy into it, but uh, on a mild decline. I believe that 620, 630 range on the downside will hold. So, any 20, 30 point decline, I think the stock should be added gradually and uh, uh, eventually, I think in the next four or five months, it could possibly meet the earlier highs of uh, 800 plus levels. And then we might even look at higher levels. Uh, Pedilite is something uh, which, you know, has also had a good trading rally. In fact, uh, if you look at all these stocks, the Pedilite, Asian Paints, you know, in the last few weeks, they've moved up generally. And Pedilite also made a high of 3300 before, you know, now correcting to about uh, 3230, 3220 levels. But the structure is positive. Uh, keeping yesterday's low of 3160 as a reference point, I think the stock can be bought from a trading perspective around 31, uh, 3200 with a stop below 3160 and a retest of 3300 could be there and possibly even higher levels could be tested. So positive on both and would want to buy both on slightly lower levels. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Uh, got that, uh, Mitesh. Thanks very much uh, for it. Uh, actually, in the mid-cap market, I'm just trying to spot uh, winners. One pocket that's looking interesting is actually the, the snack makers. Hmm. Uh, Gopal Snacks on a day like today, about 6% higher. Pratap Snacks is actually moving higher now, about 3.5% on that stock as well. In the morning, Bikaji was up. Let's see if Bikaji is still retaining that gain. But uh, quite interesting. So uh, some of these names, I, I think maybe, uh, you know, hunger stocks are, are in focus. So there's Alcobev, we'll talk about that as well, Manglam. And then the snack makers not doing too, too bad today. In economics, they say, you know, there's, uh, there are products which are uh, 
recession proof. Pro corollary <laughs> products. If uh, uh, the price of X goes up, maybe the demand for Y, y goes will also down go up. as uh, well. So, <laughs> Alcobev stocks, they're doing extremely well. So maybe snack yeah. stocks are <laughs> rising in tandem <laughs> for that as well. Because he was actually up 6% yesterday as well. This yeah. morning did well. So these stocks are doing well, but it's the Alcobev stocks which are doing a lot better in today's trading session. Don't have United Spirits and Radico Khetans. Today's move, uh, you know, uh, make you feel otherwise, largely because uh, one, there has been an important development out here. What is that? The, the Andhra Pradesh cabinet has gone ahead and approved the new liquor policy. The new liquor policy was something that the street was widely anticipating. It starts from October 1, allows uh, the retail sale of uh, liquor by private players, basically putting into effect the rules that were there pre-2019. And price of select brands will also be brought down below that 99 rupees per quarter mark itself. How much can that move the needle by? For a company that has a fair amount of sales coming in from Andhra, something like Tilaknagar Industries, they said that, you know, if this is announced, then maybe for the next five years, they can see volumes compound by around 8 to 10 percent. We spoke to analysts as well, and they said that, you know, this policy can grow volumes for 7 to 8 percent for the alcohol bev players and FY26 itself could see 14 to 15 percent growth for beer and 10 to 12 percent growth for PNA spirits itself. The reason why the stocks are selling off today is because in anticipation of this news, they had seen a big rally and the mid cap index also is in a bit of a profit taking mood itself. Before this news came by, you know, Global Spirits was up 51 percent, Radiko Khaitan was up 33 percent in the month preceding this, United Spirits was up 10 percent. The only underperformer here was United Breweries. Yeah. And today, that's the one that is reacting the most positively as well. So if you pull up, you know, the intraday chart of United Breweries, you'd see that there is a big outperformance today as against uh, the underperformance that we had seen in the last one month itself. So maybe sell on news for uh, all the other stocks and United Breweries because it hadn't rallied. Uh, it hadn't rallied, is now participating. Now, absolutely. I remember that uh, conversation we had with Karan Torani as well. I mean, even he singled out this one stock as having the valuation comfort because it's not moved up and probably better prospects in the second half of the year with beer consumption uh, as, uh, you know, something to keep in mind. And, uh, yeah, stock's up about 4% today. Well, let's uh, take the conversation forward with uh, Devain Choksi. He's joining in to discuss some fundamental ideas. Devain, so I don't know, I mean, Alcobev stocks or uh, Namkeen, Bujia, Chips... Do you like anything? I'm not talking about the products, but but the companies in the stocks. Uh, anything in your coverage? Anything that's on your radar? Uh, good afternoon, Sundi. Alcohol, I don't drink, so I can't say I like it. <laughs> and snacks, I do eat, but I think they're too expensive <laughs> to buy. <laughs> I guess no, I mean, not not as ex but Devin probably not as expensive as the market or the stocks, right? These days you can buy the product. But buying the, the manufacturer's stock is usually a problem because of market valuations. But anyway, let's talk about these. Let's talk about uh, the names here and whether they make sense to you. Yeah, I think uh, most of the items, I think, which are listed market, they are expensively traded. And if you look at some of the names, I think their performance, the growth, I think that you see on a quarter over quarter basis or even for that matter, year over year basis, I think the profit growth is not very consistent. I think that is what I think in general I come across, I think, this particular pattern. And that's what I think I'm not fully clear about. Okay, I agree with one particular aspect that in current environment, the input costs likely to remain lower because I think most of the commodity prices are likely to behave well in the current environment. If that is so, then certainly I think there is a good chance that these companies would probably have relatively better profit margin to talk about. As such, on the other side, the top line growth is not doubted because top line growth is related to the consumer's wallet and consumer is spending money. So from that perspective, we, most of the snake stocks, I think, are likely to show top line performance far better. Bottom line performance, we have to be validated with the current cost structure, which is like slightly more uh, favorable at this point of time. That point, Devin, thanks a lot for that. Uh, and, you know, I, I speak on behalf of Devin as well. People like me and Devin are very dangerous for people who drink. Why is that? Because uh, while we will not partner you in the alcohol, uh, you know, session, both of us are compulsive munchers of all the <laughs> snacks that are there on the table. So while you can enjoy your drink, if there is bhujia, if there are any sort of namkeen, if there is any farsan, both Devin and I will finish it. We may not look like it, but we definitely are compulsive munchers out here. Uh, you know, uh, Devin, in particular, I wanted your thoughts on Bajaj Housing Finance. Why do I say that? Because, you know, you've been quite vocal about its uh, valuation differential with all the others, etc. The last two days, the street has seen some sense or, sense or rationale in, you know, booking some profits 
or the gains that we saw over the first two trading sessions of the stock itself. In the last two trading sessions, it's down about 10, 12 odd percent. At what point does it become a little more attractive for you? Yeah, so I think if you have to take, I think in perspective, the first two days of listing and I think mm. now, in first two days of listing, probably I think a lot of grey market transaction had to come up for square up because maybe I think the market was not anticipating, grey market was not anticipating the kind of subscription that the company received. And as a result of which, I think the sellers committed themselves, which ultimately they had to short cover and probably pay it off. So that's where probably you saw a surge in the stock price. I think that's well explained here. But on the other side, I think the valuation wise, the company remains far more expensive at this point of time. Even if you factor in 30% rate of CAGR growth in the loan book, you still find that I think the uh, valuation three years from now is 3.5 times price to book value for the uh, housing finance business in this case. I'm not worried about that particular 3.5 times price to book value, particularly when I see the company with the multiple revenue model stream that they have. On one side, they have got the mortgage-based revenue model. On the other side, developer finance model, a lease discounting model, and loan against property model. Except the mortgage-based model, I think in rest of the models, they have a real good ability to command better price about at, for the, at the time of lending. And assuming that this company at 160 rupee price, they have to, suppose if they have to offload 3% of their stake in the company at this point of time, probably we are talking about around 4,000 crores of rupees that they would get. The serviceable cost of the equity is only on 10, balance 150 is non for serviceable. So to that extent, I think they can actually expand the name very fast. That's a good possibility for this company and that's where I think this company uh, deserves to get the premium valuation, but it is already priced in 3.5 times price to be that is what I would like to put across. Uh, definitely very comfortable buying into this company whenever I think the opportunity comes along from the investment point of view at a little lower price. Okay, so uh, well, that's a view on uh, some of those names. Let's move to the actually the other big story of the day and that's coming in from the telecom space like we told you. Stocks are reacting very, very sharply. Uh, and this happened after the Supreme Court uh, pretty much delivered a blow to the hopes of uh, telecom players with respect to uh, you know, any relief on the uh, AGR dues and the, uh, the way those dues are being calculated. Uh, so the Supreme Court has uh, pretty much struck down that curative petition uh, saying that there's going to be no change in the adjusted gross revenue or the AGR dues. Uh, and all of those stocks have been uh, down quite a bit. The companies had, of course, uh, moved court uh, with that curative uh, petition uh, saying that there was an error in computation. Well, it was not upheld by the apex court. Uh, as you can see, the Bharti Airtel is, of course, reacting a little positively in different dynamics at play here. Perhaps the market believing that Vodafone's further loss could be Bharti and Jio's gain. But the ones where the sharpest reaction is playing out is, of course, Vodafone idea. And the other one is Indus Towers. Pull up by Indus. It's been down 10% since that verdict came in. So what happens now and what's the word on the street? Let's go across to Hormas for more. Hormas, um, plenty of price damage here. Oh, well, it is. And it's, it's even the case, right, for Vodafone Idea. It's not had a very good month whatsoever. And it's almost down 19% now. It's the biggest single day fall that the stock has seen since January of 2022. And as you mentioned, right, it was because this news came that the Supreme Court has dismissed that curative petition when it comes to the AGR dues. They filed this petition saying that there has been an error in computation. But the Supreme Court said that they have not made any case for themselves and hence these petitions are dismissed. Now, as of date, Vodafone Idea current AGR dues are around 70,300 crore rupees. It's a massive sum for uh, Vodafone Idea and just in anticipation of this verdict from the Supreme Court, a lot of brokerages had pinned hopes that there might be some relief and thereby leading to some bullish commentary on Vodafone Idea and I have uh, City had written a note on the 29th of August. They had mentioned that any potential relief can boost its stock price by 5 rupees a share and even uh, uh, Balaji Subramanian who we spoke to after the verdict had mentioned that if such a move would have transpired, then the Vodafone Idea share price could have received a 4 to 5 rupee boost as well. However, uh, it, just a few days before this verdict, uh, Goldman Sachs on the 6th of September had said that the fundraise that Vodafone Idea has done will not be enough to protect market share. They also said that their cash flow will remain negative until FY31 and as a result they had a price target of 2.5 rupees. So it will be interesting to see that these bullish calls that came in on Vodafone Idea in anticipation of this, what happens to that now? 
now when the news comes in tomorrow as of now there are 22 analysts who have coverage on the stock 13 of them have a sell recommendation four of them have a buy rating be interesting to see how the street reacts to it tomorrow especially the sell side analysts but for now 20% down on Vodafone idea stock below its fpo price of 11 rupees the biggest single day fall since january of 2022 Absolutely, take that point, Hormaz. Uh, the biggest single day fall in a long time, also below the FPO price. In fact, from its 52 week high, which it had hit post the FPO had happened, you know, closer to 19 odd rupees, the stock has now almost halved. Uh, they went, uh, you know, how should one look at this? Because Vodafone always uh, was fraught with a fair amount of risk, and one of those important risks has played out. Telecom, until Vodafone saw some signs of life, was just a one clean player that was Bharti Airtel. Then, of course, there was Reliance, but that had other parts of the business as well. What are your thoughts here? Does everyone else's loss result in one person's gain? Or should you still look at Vodafone as a hopeful after the big correction that it's seen from the top? Hey, Mangalam, for a while, I think, if you just keep aside this 30, 30, 1,000 crore worth of uh, erroneous calculation amount, I think, for which the petition was filed, I think still the total amount of dues pertaining to uh, the 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 to, to dues pertaining to AGR is about seventy odd thousand crores for Vodafone idea, and I think a total debt of around twelve or forty thousand crores. No doubt they have uh, raised money through right issue, but still I think this is a large sum of. Money. On the other side, I think when I see the business strategy, I'm not at all sure. I think which have been earlier also expressing the same point. The 4G uh, implementation, I think, which they are currently doing is probably yesterday. I think today is 5G reality and tomorrow is 6G. I think majority of the large operators, including Jio, including Bharti, have been preparing for the next level of uh, 6G implementation going forward and they have created the infrastructure ready for themselves. Today, Vodafone and BSNL kind of companies talking about 4G in order to just kept, uh, protect the customers, I think, which they otherwise lose out. I think I'm not getting that part clear because the amount of money which will be required to spend, I think, for implementation of the next generation of network is going to be equally challenging. As I see it, I think next five to six years, I think Vodafone idea, BSNL kind of companies would continuously demand cash for implementation of uh, different projects and I think technology. So to that extent, I think I'm not convinced on the fundamentals of this particular company. They would be cash angry businesses. As again, I think the cash producing business like Geo which is producing about 60,000 products of the EBITDA. So one would like to stay with the business, I think, which is producing positive EBITDA, vis-a-vis, -vis, I think, the one which is not producing that EBITDA kind of a situation. Okay. All right, uh, Devin, we will leave it on that note for today. Thank you very much for uh, joining in. You have a good rest of the afternoon. And uh, we look forward to our next conversation. We need to take a break. On the other side, key excerpts coming up from our conversation with uh, Jeffrey's Mahesh Nadurkar.
There's a fresh powder selling that we're seeing in the market right now. The Nifty is holding in the green with just about 30, 32 odd points. Uh, the stocks which are falling from the highs, uh, Apollo Hospital is currently at the lower end of today's trading range. We have Dr. Reddy's which has come down lower as well. Bharti Airtel, which was doing well too, has come off the highs. Alongside that, we have ITC and Reliance, both of them weighing down on the Nifty. So making the last hour of trade extremely crucial to track. Uh, but on the sidelines of the third uh, India forum, for Jeffries, Prashant caught up with Mahesh Nandurkar and started asking him about his views on the FII interest in India, especially in light of the recent purchases that they've been making. Let's hear that out. We have uh, more than 200 overseas investors and yeah. uh, that actually makes it uh, the largest uh, you know, ever conference by any investment bank mm -hmm. in terms of the number of foreign investors participating. Mm -hmm. um, at the same time, we also have uh, 100 plus corporates as well mm. and very, very senior level representation uh, you know, from the chairman and the founder level mm. uh, and strong representation from the government ministers yeah. uh, and other industry experts as well. Mm. Um, so the feedback that we're getting from interacting with the investors is that, I mean, just the sheer numbers, first of all, tell you that there is a lot of interest. Mm. And uh, we are seeing interest coming into India, not just from the traditional India dedicated funds or emerging market, uh, you know, fund man uh, fund managers, but also global mm -hmm. mandates uh, as well. Mm -hmm. uh, but clearly, what uh, you know, while the interest is at an extremely high level, mm -hmm. uh, at the same time, there are some concerns around the valuation. Mm -hmm. uh, so nobody denies the fact that the economic story, the corporate earnings growth story, is looking very strong, mm -hmm. and. Uh, very strong on an absolute basis, mm. very strong on a relative basis as well, okay. uh, because especially now with the expected slowdown in the U.S. economy, mm. uh, the differential growth for India's GDP, the differential growth for Indian corporate sector EPS growth is looking even better. Okay. Um, the key question is whether market is already mm. factoring uh, you know, that in. Mm. And uh, what has happened is you know, with a big surge of domestic liquidity, mm. The foreign investors have been looking out for an opportunity mm. uh, to invest and you know, that opportunity has been denied uh, to them uh, uh, sort of so far. Do they feel a little left out? I think they do because what has also happened is that the uh, number of stocks in the benchmark, if you look at MSCI India, which is the very common benchmark followed by many foreign investors, mm. five years ago we had about 75, 78 stocks. Mm. Today that number is more than 150 which means about 70 stocks have got added mm. into the benchmark. These are all new companies mm. uh, across infrastructure, manufacturing, digital economy and so on. Mm. And many of these companies and the sectors themselves mm. in many cases are not well understood okay. uh, by many of the foreign investors. So, I mean, on one hand, you had an issue of valuations going up because of the strong domestic liquidity. Mm. And on the other hand, uh, inclusion of several new uh, stocks into the benchmark, mm. which have actually outperformed the benchmark, mm. where the foreign investors did not have enough familiarity Correct. with the sectors, with the company management, with the style of working, etc. Mm. So that has prevented them from taking active positions mm. in many of these names. Mm. Uh, so yes, to that extent, there is mm. uh, that uh, feeling mm. uh, you know, of missing out. And it kind of ties in with the point which uh, sort of I was talking to Chris earlier, and he was saying that if people who are foreigners who are very familiar with India, they are still okay with what's going on and the kind of surge we are seeing. But generalist FIIs at the margin who are not very familiar, valuations and what's been happening is a bit, of, bit, bit more of an issue for them. So yes. they are staying away. I think yes. uh, you, you, you're you echoing that in, in that sense, right? True, true, absolutely. I think one of the biggest change which has happened in the Indian economy mm. uh, is the turnaround of the investment cycle. Mm. So the fixed capital formation as a share of GDP has been consistently falling from 2010 down to 2020. Mm. And at that time, uh, a very narrow set of high quality stocks mm. did exceedingly well. Uh, and many investors actually did very well mm. by being positioned in those narrow set of very high quality uh, stocks and the multiples for many of the stocks went through the roof. Mm. Um, but uh, the turnaround in the investment cycle, which basically talks about the improvement in the risk appetite mm. in the Indian economy, mm. not in the markets, mm. the Indian economy. Mm. The risk appetite in the Indian economy has gone up quite a lot over the last two, three years with more investments in infrastructure and manufacturing, in real estate, in power and so on. Mm. Those have been neglected sectors. Mm. And uh, yeah, so I think uh, 
what we've been highlighting uh, is exactly this big change of trend, mm. which has a huge implication for sector mm. uh, and stock selection. Mm. Um, yeah, and so my sense is that uh, you know, as uh, more foreign investors, uh, you know, sort of you know take into their stride what has changed in India or mm. what is changing in India, mm. uh, you know, I believe uh, the the leadership in terms of the sector and the stocks. Uh, will be very different over the next 10 years as compared to the last 10 years. You know, a point that I've been making for some time, but it still, uh, you know, has long legs. And they've got to get familiar real quick, right? Because otherwise <laughs> they get elbowed out very fast. Because True. this surge of domestic money leaves little room in that sense. So Absolutely. And that's been a problem, I guess, uh, for, for, for a lot of locals as well. Uh, yeah. Local and domestic institutional investors as well. Yes. Uh, Mahesh, so uh, two things. What are they most excited about uh, for, uh, for large foreign investors? Uh, uh, what, 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 what is the worry, if there is one, uh, that, that you picked up? I think the single biggest worry is still, uh, you know, on the valuation side, as we just discussed, okay. and uh, you know whether, uh, you know whether, as I said, uh, you know the good news is already factored in. Okay. Uh, but outside of that, uh, you know, there is also, uh, you know, some worry about um, the recent uh, sort of election mandates and mm. what, how, and what kind of impact. Mm. Uh, that it has, uh, you know, on the capex activities, the yeah, the government's investment plans going forward. Mm. Uh, we've already seen some uh, changes uh, at the state government level mm. uh, in terms of the policy making, and we've seen uh, that there has been more uh, sort of social spending and a lot of handouts across. A lot of handouts. Yeah, it's 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 yeah, it's been happening. So there is that worry uh, that whether the similar things can happen at the central government level as well. Uh, and then what kind of impact that it can have on this, the, you know, I talked about this turnaround in the investment cycle, whether that gets, uh, you know, stimulated by that. Uh, but thankfully, uh, you know, we had a few very senior ministers, you know, at the conference and they clearly allayed, uh, mm -hmm. you know, those concerns. Mm -hmm. uh, but actually, I would go uh, one step ahead and actually highlight uh, that one of the biggest misconceptions, I would say, uh, in the Indian market today is that it's the government spending which is driving CAPEX. Mm -hmm. And the private sector is lagging behind. Mm. Uh, actually, that's a big misconception, uh, in my view, mm. because uh, I mean, barring just one or two sectors like refining and petrochemicals, all other sectors mm. are already seeing heavy investment from the private sector, right. be it steel or cement or infrastructure sectors like power and like telecom and airports mm. and seaports and mm. and so on. And if you look at even the hard macro data, mm. that shows you that, uh, like last year, mm. uh, the private corporate capex growth was up 18 percent. Mm. Household capex growth, which is in housing sector, which mm. is real estate, was also up 18 uh, to 20 percent. That's uh, you know already there. Um, also, more bottom-up data, uh, like the ones reported by RBI mm. recently, mm. Uh, wherein they have uh, taken together. The, the private projects mm. approved by banks mm. for funding. They have not, the loan disbursals haven't happened as yet, sure. the loans approved. Mm. And if you look at that trend, it already shows a 20% CAGR okay. between FI 19. I'm not talking FI 20 because that was a low base. Right. If you look at the pre-COVID year, from there also it has grown 20%. So I think the common perception that private sector spending is there. lagging and therefore everything depends on the government and if they slow down, what happens? I think that uh, sort of conception. That's and the fire has been lit. The spark has been is there, and it's a, it's going to be self-sustaining cycle. Absolutely, and Absolutely. perhaps will last for some time, right? I mean, we are. Yeah. Uh, so these cycles are usually eight to ten year cycles. Right. So I mean, broadly speaking, I can say that 2000 to 2010 was an up cycle. Mm. 2010 to 20 was a down cycle. Mm. 21 was the turnaround, and mm. I think you know if you just go by the sheer history. Uh, and I'm not going by sheer history, there are other numbers as well. Sure, sure. Uh, but I think this cycle should last till 2030, if mm. not longer. Okay. Uh, so, you know, sectorally speaking, you were very bullish on real estate as a space, capital goods, industrial, etc. for the last uh, many years. They've done very well. Yeah. But you've turned a little bit now, right? A little more, is it just tactically turning a little cautious? Or is it a more fundamental change in view? Yeah. Uh, no, because stocks have run up quite a bit. Go on. Yeah, stocks have run up. Uh, so yeah, this shift is a uh, is a bit more tactical. Mm. So as I mentioned, these cycles are long, mm. uh, and we are somewhere in the initial or maybe the mid stages mm. of cycle in some of these sectors. You know, if you look at it. So I still have firm believer that the real estate cycle, the infra, the capex, the manufacturing cycle will go on till 2030, mm. if not longer. Mm. 
Why I'm saying if not longer, because this time the regulators have also acting, mm. are also acting, the government uh, uh, sort of policies are also acting in a very prudent manner. Mm. They're actually learning from the, the mistakes that we did in the previous cycle. Sure. Uh, ideally, the goal of the policymakers is to avoid this boom bust cycle. Mm. So we have a, a sustained but a longer term up cycle. Mm. So, yeah, so to answer your question, uh, still very, very optimistic on the real estate and the infra capex cycle. Uh, but yeah, but at some of the stock level, I believe uh, given the huge surge mm. of domestic liquidity has taken the valuations in some of these stocks or some of these sectors uh, to a higher level. And I'm not just commenting on the valuations, actually I'm just commenting on the quantum of the flows mm. that are coming in. Uh, and while I've been a big bull on this whole um, financialization of savings and the equity culture emergence in the Indian households. Mm. But I think some of the numbers have gone up in a big way mm. and I think maybe to an extent gone to a level which I feel are unsustainably high mm. from the flows perspective. Mm. Uh, so therefore we have uh, taken you know some money off the table on some of these infra capex uh, you know real estate names but as I said it's a tactical view the fundamental view still remains bullish from a long term perspective. <laughs> So Jeffries is not altering its call, still remains uh, quite uh, favorably, favorably disposed towards uh, capex plays and real estate uh, among uh, some of their preferred sectors. We'll take a break on that note, come back on the other side. And of course, uh, all the latest buzz from dealing rooms today. We'll be uh, joined by Nimesh and then of course some trading calls coming up with Mintesh Thakur as well. Welcome back. So we still have 20 minutes to go. The, you know, the markets managed to hold on to a little bit of uh, the gain on the Nifty. So at least that fall hasn't accentuated uh, basically in you know, a 30 to 40 point uh, up move 
on the index. We have Nimesh joining in. Nimesh, uh, so the big day is finally over. The Fed reaction is played, up, played out. <coughs> Excuse me. And a fair amount of underperformance here in India. Oh, absolutely. You know, Surabhi, uh, looks like it's a clear uh, day of uh, sell-on news. We saw that happening in the U.S. markets last night after, and, and that's playing out in India as well. You know, the big uh, Fed event seems to be out of the way now. It came as a bit of a surprise, 50 basis point, but it's done now. So I guess that's the reason why you're seeing a bit of profit booking as well. Uh, whether Nifty is holding on, uh, thanks to some sector rotation, it's the broader markets which are under pressure today. And, you know, uh, I was talking to some larger investors and, and, and there was an interesting feedback that I picked up. Uh, if you look at today's market as well, uh, it's largely dragged by telecom names uh, because of that uh, Supreme Court, uh, uh, you know, shocker and, and the PSUs. You know, what on PSUs, uh, uh, Surabhi, clearly, you know, uh, you know the, the leader of this bull market was the PSUs and that seems to be under pressure now. And maybe that is why you're seeing a bit of underperformance in the broader market stocks as well. So, uh, you know, for a while, there was a lot of feedback from investors that maybe a time has come for the large caps to outperform mid caps. Maybe today is the first, you know, confirmation of the same that from here on, maybe for the, for the time being, you'll see a bit of outperformance in the, in the nifty. And that's also because of some bit of rotation will happen. So yesterday we saw banks participating, today we are seeing FMCG and consumer names participating on the upside. So I guess that's, that's likely to be the trend. From a flow perspective, again, it's a mixed day. I'm not hearing very large selling, but you might see a big sell number largely because of uh, two pockets. One is telecom, which was little overbought from institutions of late, and of course the PSUs as well. So that's the pain point for in today's market, but it looks like it's a first sign of, of you know, a reversal in trend, wherein the broader markets underperform, and you see a bit of outperformance in the Nifty to continue. So interesting, Nimesh, uh, that, you know, up until now, everyone was saying the PSU basket is overbought. Uh, there is a bit of a frenzy out there, etc. And that large caps have some value on offer. But it, when that switch happens, when, you know, it starts to see, uh, you know, when the market starts to see that, what was being told already, people suddenly still get scared once again. Uh, that's the way the market works. Uh, what are the individual yeah. stocks that you're wa watching? Well, you know, so as I said, there is a bit of sector rotation happening. And within that, the first name in my list is Nestle. But second day running, that stock is re uh, relatively outperforming. Even in today's weak market, it's up 2 percent. The delivery is on a higher side. And I understand some domestic mutual funds, especially one large mutual fund, has done an active buyer in Nestle of late. And hence, a bit of outperformance there. So that's the first name. The second stock is Vanbury. A small stock, but in a, in a weak market like today, that's relatively outperforming. Last I checked, it was up 5 percent. The volumes are slightly on the better side. And I understand the company is likely to raise funds, preferably through, uh, through a pref issue is a buzz as far as Vanbury is concerned. The third name is Bandhan Bank. Uh, you know, while there was high delivery mark for larger banks like ICC Bank and Kotak Bank in the last few days, Bandhan Bank stands out today on back of very strong buy flows. So expect high delivery volumes, and there is a very high FI buying happening in, in Bandhan Bank at these levels. And the last name is Oracle Finance. For second day running, that stock is under pressure. Uh, the stock is already in FNO ban. We saw a 10% cut yesterday, 4.5% 4, 4, 4 cut today as well. But at these levels, some bit of cash buying has started in Oracle from larger FIs. So it looks like uh, some institutional activity on the cash side has started in Oracle Finance. Right, uh, Nimesh, thanks a lot for that. So those were a bunch of stocks which uh, Nimesh has picked bits on and the dealings, dealing room set up as well. Good time to get in Nime uh, Mitesh for the reverse trade tomorrow. Mitesh, uh, what is the tomorrow trade? Is it more uh, short or is it on the long side? I have, in fact, long ideas. Though during the day, we had some short calls as well. Uh, I see, I see GI after a pullback seems to be recovering well. So, BTST here with a stop at 2184 for targets of 2230. And Max Health is uh, something you know, which I would recommend as a short term trading buy. Keep a stop below levels of uh, 960 and uh, look for targets of 1045. When you say ICICI, GI, you mean uh, the general insurance business, right? That's right. That's right. Perfect. So, we'll, we'll just flash that uh, on the screen for you. And Max Health, you just pointed that out. It's a big, big up move that we're seeing on the stock. In fact, uh, it's currently seen a bit of a spike as we speak as well. But uh, let's move on. Uh, one of the stocks which is surging right now is Spencer's Retail. Uh, it's up 11% uh, and most of the gains have happened in just the last uh, couple of minutes or so. And decent volumes out there as well. All the other RP Sanjeev Goenka owned group companies are buzzing around. The BPM service provider First Source has announced an expansion in the Australian market as well. The company set, will set up a new headquarter in Melbourne. Speaking to CNBC TV18, Sanjeev Goenka says that he remains steadfast on his target to increase First Source profits. 
by two and a half times in the next three years and margins by 3% as well. He hints that the company could announce an important overseas acquisition soon as well. This is something we'll keep an eye out on. Listen to that conversation. We'll slip into a short break, come back, and thereafter talk about the market closing. First source has been, over the last few years, we've been reinventing ourselves such that we can earn the right to grow. And having progressed significantly on that journey of having earned or earning the right to grow, we are now growing. US, UK, and we do believe the third major international market for us could be Australia. It's a beginning. We are enthused by what the state of Victoria offers. We are enthused by the fact that they have some large corporate presence there. And we do believe that we can make a difference in the offering that we make to companies there. Right. Now, uh, First Source has been bringing digital transformation solutions to companies across the board for many years now. What's going to be the quantum of your investment uh, when you're setting up this base or your headquarters in Melbourne? In this uh, industry, when you talk of investments, you talk of FTEs. So you don't really talk of million dollars per se, but you talk of FTEs. So we begin small. We begin with about three to 500 FTEs, but we'll grow and we'll ramp it up very rapidly. Mm. Okay, so there's a, a plan to uh, increase growth and investments rapidly, but why Australia, if we were to ask you, why did you choose this as your next destination for growth? There are many corporates who are headquartered in Australia. And we do believe that's an opportunity that exists. It's an opportunity to be grabbed. Uh, and you don't have too many major service providers there. Mm. OK. Uh, now, in terms of uh, the jobs that are getting created, one, onshore in Australia. And does this also uh, help you increase the flow of employees from India to Australia? How many uh, jobs could it create in Australia and how many jobs from the Indian market? Typically, onshore-offshore ratios would be one is to three. And so for every job that's created in Australia, you'd expect to see three in India. Right. Uh, and what would be the focus of First Source's business and expansion plans in Australia right now? You have been saying that AI and generative AI is the big priority for you right now. So can we expect First Source to work in that direction with clients in Australia? Definitely. Definitely. And we do believe we will work on our strengths on the basic sectors that we operate in, where we excel in. Those are the sectors that we will like to take our experiences from other countries to Australia. Right. How, how, what, what kind of growth are you expecting in the Australian market? You've already been present in US and UK. How, do you, how significantly do you expect Australia to contribute to First Source's business in the coming years? I think over a period of time, we do expect Australia to become a significant contributor. The last quarter, First Source gave the highest growth in revenue terms for the industry. Uh, and which we've never had in the past. Mm. So it just proves that we are growing, growing faster than the industry. Mm. Uh, whether we'll continue to be the fastest or not, I don't know, but we will continue to be amongst the fastest growth rate companies in the sector. Right. Uh, any acquisitions uh, that are on the cards for First Source? <laughs> you know, inorganic uh, growth is a way of life as much as organic growth is. And as we speak, there are different conversations going on with different companies. Mm. So fingers crossed, hopefully soon. OK, maybe we can uh, uh, nudge you a little more. Is it going to be in the AI space? Uh, 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 just wait. OK. Just wait. Uh, Hopefully soon. Hopefully soon. All right. Uh, if we were to ask you about within different business solutions that you're offering right now, which ones are you most bullish about or you expect the company to focus on in the greatest possible manner over the next few years? You know, we do. It's the number one priority, maybe. 
I don't think I'm going to single out just one priority. I mean, if I had to take one objective for First Source, it would be a growth in margins and a growth in revenues. Mm. We do expect margins to grow by 3% over the next few years, and that's our target. And that's what we are working on uh, very, very consciously. And to have significant growth in our revenues organically plus inorganically. Welcome back. Spencer's Retail, the stock is up 10%. We were talking about it. Uh, we understand that, you know, uh, the commentary that has come in on Spencer's Retail from Sanjeev going out to an interview on money control itself. He suggests that they are likely to break even by March itself. And also, they have too have announced their foray into quick commerce with 30-minute deliveries. And 30-minute deliveries is something that, you know, a lot of these other players are looking at as well. And that, that's caused a bit of a flutter among all the retail players too. So look at Avenue Supermarts. That too has recovered about 4% from lows, currently moved to the high point of trade. So just keep an eye out on, uh, you know, legacy incumbent retailers, brick-and-mortar retailers looking to up their ante with 30-minute uh, to two-hour deliveries as well. And some of them even giving express deliveries at, uh, uh, you know, at, at, at no delivery cost attached. So as a result of which, we are seeing these stocks uh, gain some traction. Amrish Baliga joins us now. Amrish, uh, do you track Spencer's? What are your thoughts on Spencer's at current levels? No, in fact, I don't track it closely, but the sort of news which is coming out as far as uh, this quick delivery is concerned, I think uh, that's positive. And the other thing is about uh, the profitability, uh, which Mr. Goenka talked about. I think both these are positive because of which, uh, even in the market like this, uh, we have seen the stock moving up. Uh, but then I think uh, this will be only sentimental. I mean, until we really start seeing that in black and white, I don't think uh, we, we can see a major up move. But then, uh, yes, temporarily, yes, I think you can see uh, possibly a bit more uh, due to the momentum. Okay, got that. Uh, Amrish, hi, good afternoon. Uh, day of correction yes, for the <laughs> for the broader markets. But, you know, if you talk about the large cap space, one stock that's uh, done really well, unlike a lot of its other PSU peers, is actually NTPC. I guess the market's getting excited about this renewables IPO, right? Anything green, it has a right word, the right sound uh, with the market lapping up these ideas. 
What's your sense, I mean, on, on the base business itself and how you would look at the renewable side of it? Uh, in fact, I've been liking NTPC for a while, especially because of the sort of a focus which they have on, 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 on uh, green energy. And uh, because of which, uh, I mean, I, I also have a pick today, uh, which is uh, from a similar space, uh, which is SJVN. Uh, I mean, it's been uh, recently been declared a, a Navratna company. Uh, like I said, basically renewable power. I mean, they have about 12 projects, uh, which works out about 2,500 megawatts and two transmission lines uh, in operation. Uh, and a decently large expansion plan is underway. In fact, they have four hydro projects of about 1,500 megawatts, one thermal of 1,320 megawatts, and about 11 solar power projects of close to about 2,000 megawatts. And uh, if you see in the next two to three years, SJVN's capacity will go up from 2,500 megawatts, which was as of FI24, to 10,000 megawatts, which is 4x uh, the FI24 capacity. And uh, if you look at the longer term plans which they have, uh, they're talking about 25,000 megawatts by 2030, about 50,000 megawatts by 2040. So this can be a long term multi bagger story. But then if you're talking of the next year or two, uh, I mean, again, we can expect uh, the subsidiary, which is a green energy arm, to come out with an IPO, just like what uh, NTPC has recently announced. So FI26, uh, I mean, I expect the revenues to grow by about 3x compared to FI24, and EPS project is about 8 rupees. So my target for SJVN is 160. And uh, as far as NTPC is concerned, uh, I mean, there my target is about 480, 490. Right. Um, just before we, you know, head to close, a quick word on Gillette, if you track that, because, you know, that stock was holding up in the green for most part of today's trading session. They held an analyst meet yesterday, speaking about long growth, uh, you know, levers for the company, including premiumization and uh, the female products, which are doing extremely well for them as well, which now contribute in double digits to their grooming range. Yeah, but then see, unlike in the past, uh, I think there is a decent amount of competition which is uh, coming up uh, from some of the existing players. You have uh, those uh, new uh, boys uh, on the block. So, uh, I mean, I, I really don't think uh, that the sort of premiumization which they had in the past and they could uh, get that valuation, I don't think uh, that will happen going ahead. So, I, really, I, I mean, I, I'm really not buying to the story at this point of time. In fact, uh, if it moves up because of this, it could be possible be a selling opportunity for those who've been holding for a long time. Okay, all right, got that. Uh, Amrish, thanks very much. Shorter chat today, but yeah. appreciate you being with us and uh, giving us some perspective. We are uh, winding down the day, and the day is going to end with a gain which is a lot lower, a lot lesser. A fraction of how we started, I mean, the opening gap was uh, almost 200 points up. And now we're going to go home with just about a 70-point move. Nonetheless, it's not as bad as the lowest point of the day. So that's something to kind of hold on to. Talk about the large cap screen on the upside, NTPC, the stock that we were just discussing. And banks have really ensured that there's no wider decline. Bank Nifty itself is up about six-tenths of percent, the, one of the best performing indices of the day. And if you look at uh, some of the constituents, Kotak Mahindra Bank, HDFC Bank, there's a fair amount of green out here. Then you had, of course, a lot of consumer stocks to thank for the fact that we're still closing in green. Nestle, Tata Consumer, HUL, uh, even ITC last I checked, uh, yeah, still up about just about a quarter percent. Some of these names on the positive side as well. Uh, Maruti, uh, Bharti Airtel, Bajaj Auto, these are some of the you know auto names which have had a good day, even Tata Motors for that matter. So auto and uh, consumer, two good parts of the market along with banks. What didn't work? PSU, PSU and more PSU. So BPCL, ONGC, Coal India, a lot of these stocks were lower. And even IT, second day running, I mean, in the morning, these stocks were looking okay. But by the afternoon, by the close, we have a cut of about half a percent to about one, one and a half percent, depending on which stock you're looking at. TCS uh, being down a whole one percent. Well, uh, for the mid-cap index, you know, it ended lower. But you can say it ended down, but not quite out. Because uh, from the highs of the day, it uh, corrected about 750 points. From the lows of the day, it actually recovered about 1,100 points as well. So there was more recovery than decline from the lows. And that's something that the street would take from uh, take note of the nifty as well you know uh, the expiry happened right in the range that uh, the option writers were positioned for as well among the top losers on the mid cap end of things 
for Vodafone, Idea and Indus Towers. Of course, uh, the Supreme Court news not helping the cause of these telecom players. Then you had uh, Chambal Fertilizers down about 8% as well. And then we did see some decline in a couple of these PSU names like Hindustan Aeronautics, etc. On the way up, uh, the big gainers in the FNO space in particular were uh, United Breweries, uh, the Andhra Liquor Policy, aiding their cause. We also saw some traction in Jubilant Foodworks, which ended about 3% higher, AU Small Finance Bank, and then a couple of these mid-cap ITs actually outperformed the large-cap ITs as well. And that was the word that, you know, came in from someone like Nilesh Shah as well, who said that mid-cap IT is a better place than large-cap IT. So first source and persistent systems, of course, we heard from uh, Sanjeev Goenka on first source. Then from the absolute broad markets, the small cap indices, we had big gains coming in, these snack makers, Gopal Snacks, we had, um, you know, Pratap Snacks, doing well. Spencer's Retail also on the QCOM foray did well. But on the way down, we had Bajaj Housing Finance down about 7.5% down for the second day running. And also PN Gargil, after the stellar listing that we saw in the earlier part of the week, the stock ended about 8% lower today and off its 52-week high down 16%. All in all, a weak session for the mid-cap index which continues, but not as weak as the lowest point of the day would suggest. Okay, and with that, it's curtains on this edition of Closing Bell. Many thanks for being with us. But to see you just after this small break. Markets Forward coming up next.